Hello everyone, I'm Katherine Thompson. I'm a graduate student here at the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography, and I'm currently getting my PhD in Biological Oceanography. My specialization is in multi-decadal geospatial analyses, particularly in how climate change is affecting our estuaries. This video is part of the Metcalf Institute Science Immersion Workshop. Today, we'll be talking about how to orient yourself to the basic components of a graph. We will also discuss vital details such as aliasing, time scaling, and potential ways that data can be manipulated through graphs. I will also walk through common types of graphs and figures you may see in marine science articles and how to interpret them. Finally, I will briefly discuss where we get our data and how we turn raw data into graphs. Why is it important to speak the language? Well, scientific research is complex and often requires a lot of data that needs to be processed and statistically analyzed. These results can be difficult to communicate through words alone, so visualizations like graphs and figures are often needed. Understanding this language is especially important for understanding multi-decade research, such as climate change. For instance, I have a figure from the IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, right here. This report came out in 2023, so you know that these results are fairly recent. This figure communicates a lot of information, so let's walk through it real quick. There are three separate categories, one for the annual hottest day temperature change, one for the annual mean total column soil moisture change, and then one for the annual wettest day precipitation change. Within each of these categories, there are four different depictions. These are linked to the uh, different possible global warming level scenarios. So 1.5 degrees Celsius above the temperatures that we saw in the 1850s and 1900s, one for two degrees, three degrees, and then four degrees. By organizing the results of the uh, report like this, it is much easier for readers to compare and contrast visually and to understand the uh, true message of the report very fast. This allows for uh, a lot more efficient processing, like visual mental processing, than through just words alone. However, this is a much more advanced graph, so let's take a step back and talk about the basics. Let's take a step back and talk about some of the basic components of a graph. The first thing to do when you look at a graph is to orient yourself to the axes. The axes are your map and compass for any graph. Here's another example of a graph. This is much more simple than the one I showed from the IPCC. The data for this was collected off the coast of the University of Rhode Island's big campus. We lowered a sensor into the bay, stopping at specific depths and recording the salinity. Depth was measured in meters, and salinity was measured in practical salinity units. With this data, we can link the depth of the bay to the salinity of the water. Now, graphs function basically like a coordinate system. You can look at a point on a graph and get two values that are linked together. So for instance, let's say this point here. At a depth of two meters, we know that the value of salinity should be roughly 30.9 or so. That is because these two values are linked based off of the axes that they are on. This axis right here is our x-axis. This is going to be our independent variable. This represents the input or the cause of what we are looking at. It stands alone and it is not going to be impacted by the y-axis. So for instance, if I were to add a lot of salt into the water, that's not going to necessarily mean that the water is going to become deeper, right? The depth will not be influenced by the y-axis at all. However, the y-axis is our dependent variable. It's going to be reacting to our x variable. It is very, very much dependent on this axis. Sometimes, however, axes can be flipped around. Uh, however, there will always be one that is still the independent variable and one that is the dependent variable. So this is still the same graph from the previous slide where depth is our x axis and y is our salinity, whereas this one uh, is flipped around so that our depth is actually our y axis and the salinity is our x axis. However, our depth did not become our independent, or it does not become our dependent variable. It remains our independent one. The salinity does not become the independent one. It still remains the dependent variable. Both of these depictions are still perfectly valid as the data is not, it, it hasn't changed between either of them. So for instance, if we look at, you know, our two meters again, it still appears to be around 30.9. If we come over here to a depth of two, it still looks like it's going to be roughly 30.9 as well. The data between these two graphs is the exact same, but there are just two different ways to depict this. In fact, this type of graph here 
where depth is listed on the y-axis is very common in oceanography, especially when we're talking about different measurements of like, you know, salinity or dissolved oxygen or chlorophyll, temperature, light, that might be dependent on the depth. Time is generally depicted along the x-axis, but it may be presented in either direction. It's critical to read the title and axis labels to understand what the graph is actually depicting. This first graph shows the change of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere throughout time, but we should stop to consider how time is actually defined on this graph. It says thousands of years ago, meaning that this 100 right over here is actually 100,000, this is 200,000, and so on. It's really important to understand the time scale of scientific studies as long-term trends are critical to understanding what is natural fluctuation and what is something that is far more significant. For instance, if this was simply labeled as time, it could be individual years, and this could show the variation over the course of 800 years, not 800,000. Or it could be interpreted as 800 weeks, or minutes, or even seconds. A good graph will clearly label what unit they are using along each axis. Moving on to our second graph, we should look at our x-axis again. It is not labeled as thousands of years ago, like our previous graph was. It is presenting uh, the years as individual years, and if you notice, it says age before years present. So what the main difference between these two graphs is that although the data here moves in a chronological order, this data is actually moving backwards in time, where this data point here is the most recent data. And the data that we see over here is older data. Assuming the sources of this data is the same, these graphs should be roughly uh, equivalent to each other. One of them is simply just using a different scale, and the other is using the um, going in a different direction. Speaking of different scales, it's possible to convey different messages with the same data by simply changing the scales. The first question we should ask when considering scale is whether or not an axis starts at zero. So for instance, with our x-axis here, it does start at zero. It starts at zero years before the year present, which makes sense because this is supposed to be the present year for this data set. Our y-axis, however, does not start at zero. It starts roughly around maybe 175 or so. So these low values here are not actually zero. This can cause some values like this one up here to become much more inflated, making this value look like the uh, atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide are much higher than anything in the past. So if we change that scale and we include zero in our y-axis, it looks very different, despite the fact that the data is the exact same. This can cause the message that we want to display here to become very, very, very different. Um, the fluctuations here do not look as severe compared to the more recent points. Another question to ask is whether or not the scale is linear. Here with this graph, the concentration of carbon dioxide is depicted on a logarithmic scale. These are very, very common for data sets that have a lot of variation that might be lost on a normal linear scale. Whereas a linear scale depicts all values evenly on a one-to-one -one basis, logarithms don't. So it's important to look at these tick marks here. The values one through 10 are labeled appropriately, but you may notice they are spread out unevenly. It's also important to note that if you pass a certain magnitude, such as 10 or 100 or 1000, all the lines above that are equivalent to that magnitude. So these lines go from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then we go from 10, 20, 30, 40 to 100, and so on. So this number right here, for instance, is actually 500, not 105. While all these scales are still accurately showing data, they can give off very different impressions. It's important to stop and consider why some might have chosen to depict the data at a different scale. For instance, depicting on a logarithmic scale might make it seem that there's no major change in carbon dioxide concentrations over the last 400 years. However, depicting it literally without a zero on the axis makes the shift fluctuations look much more prominent. Someone could try to use either of these graphs to make a statement about climate change severity. So it's always important to consider the scales given with each graph as they might be manipulated to support a particular message. For instance, this was a bar graph used in a Chevy ad. The ad claimed that more than 98% of all Chevy trucks sold in the last 10 years are still on the road. At first glance, it appears that Chevy cars are much more durable than, say, Toyota or Nissan. However, if you look closer to the y-axis, you know that this only goes from 95 to 100%. Zero is not included on this axis. If you were to add it, those values look a lot more different and honestly don't seem to have that much of a difference. Um, 
I do want to be clear, however, uh, a graph not including zero along the axis does not necessarily mean that it's misleading. Uh, for instance, if I was depicting data about the health of residents in a nursing home above the age of 70, I would be obfuscating the results of that survey by including the, the having the scale start at zero. It would be harder to understand the difference in health between someone who is 80 and someone who is 90, for instance, if the scale was something like this. Another famous example of um, data, or maybe I should say another infamous example of data manipulation is this graph from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. It is intended to highlight the impact of this particular piece of legislation on gun deaths in the state. We might first interpret this graph to mean that the gun deaths in Florida have dropped significantly after this legislation was passed. However, if we look at our y-axis again, we'll notice that it's flipped. This is, while this is similar to how oceanographers might depict salinity at different depths, the usage of a flipped axis here is intentionally misleading. In reality, this plot should be read like this to properly understand these values. Um, as we see here, uh, it has gone up significantly compared to the previous years. So while they tried to make this look like the law uh, passed decreased deaths, it actually made them significantly higher. I would also like to point out that uh, while graphs can be used to manipulate the data and depict it uh, in misleading ways and to try and push a message, they can also provide more context to cherry-picked examples. Uh, while yes, there was more Arctic ice in 2009 in April compared to uh, April of 1989, the rest of this graph does not show the same trend. Therefore, it would be inaccurate to say that as a whole, the area of Arctic ice is greater in 2009 than it was in 1989. While line graphs are some of the most common depictions of data, they are not the only ones that scientists use. Let's talk about some of the common ones found in scientific research. With map plots, the collected data are displayed over geospatial areas of interest. While these are fairly intuitive, a good caption is critical to helping readers understand the link between data and the geospatial location. For example, looking at this graph, we can see that this is Nova Scotia, we see right there, but without looking at the legend or any captions, it's really hard to understand what we're looking at. So these legends and our captions are going to basically function as our axes in order to understand what we are looking at. So right here, we see uh, that the size of the circles, which were presumably are these pie graphs here, are proportional to the values of landing, and that the yellow, green, and blue are responsible for depicting the lobsters, snow crabs, and other landings. Um, that's great and all, but what are these boxes and what are these dots? It's a little bit still hard to understand with just legend, so we have to break out the caption. So as it says here, the values of fisheries landings associated with each lobster fishing area, which is what the LFA up here means, uh, in the Maritimes region of fisheries and oceans in Canada, the landings are reported at the community level and aggregated at the level of LFA. The size of pie charts of each LFA, which are these circles that were mentioned before, is scaled by the total value of landings and proportions presented for lobster, snow crab, and all other species. So basically the lobster fishing areas are what these LFAs are and we know that from the caption. We could have possibly gleaned that from the title here but it will still would have been a little bit unclear. So reading the captions of map plots uh, is really really important. Additionally it also says that the DFO small craft harbor locations are represented by the black dots. So um, that's what these dots are here. So now that we know that we can interpret this a little bit easier. So we look at this, we know it's Nova Scotia, we know that we're looking at lobsters and snow crab landings, and we know that each of these uh, rectangles are these lobster fishing areas that probably have a lot of regulations and um, that, you know, like they're, they're delineated in very specific areas so that they can be tracked individually. We also know that these little dots are specific harbors so that we know that a region like this that has a lot of dots has a lot of harbors, so it's not that surprising that it has a much larger pie chart than this region over here that doesn't have as many harbors. And so there's other things that you can start you know, thinking about and looking into and researching from there with those 
those uh, sorts of data. So next up, we have uh, other uh, maps. These are going to be your color contours, though. So the, the language of these plots is fairly intuitive, and a lot of people are very familiar with stuff like this from watching the Weather Channel. Uh, sometimes they're also called heat maps, but uh, the color contour plot has a very specific scale, the color bar, uh, to show you the distribution of values. So for instance, this is the chlorophyll in the water. The purple region shows the least amount of chlorophyll. This, uh, this gyre in the middle of the ocean doesn't exactly have a lot of productivity, whereas, you know, uh, off the coast of California, there is a lot more productivity because of the coastal upwelling. Uh, so it's not surprising that there's a lot more chlorophyll than that region. Uh, there are more regions of higher chlorophyll. Um, I know the, the sardinella in this population or this portion of the African coast is very, very productive, which, you know, that's uh, usually a side effect of high levels of chlorophyll. So Additionally, um, we also have this plot that I also made from the uh, Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management's data that shows these contours for the temperature of October 1997 within the Narragansett Bay. And it'll show you, uh, you know, the obviously the colder temperatures are in blue here. So this region is from 16.4 degrees to 17.1 and then this region over here uh, is much hotter and is you know nearly three degrees warmer than the other regions so well than the region that i mentioned before categorical data is very similar to the last two maps that we looked at but instead of having the bands of color these are going to be binned into very specific categories. Like for instance, this figure uh, looks at the mass of river plastic flowing into oceans per year. And the MPW value here, which is our mismanaged plastic waste, is set into five different categories. If this was the other color contour map, that would just be one pure gradient, but it is uh, specifically binned into these different categories here. Additionally, we also have the, uh, the tons of plastic input from rivers that we can see. Uh, unsurprisingly, some of these areas are towards where some of the larger rivers of the world are. Um, and they also do tend to correlate, at least over here, with uh, larger uh, portions of mismanaged plastic waste. So those are two different... Uh, data points that we can understand and link to their geospatial uh, coordinates just from looking at this one figure. Not all scientific visuals require an axis or a legend to understand. Artistic figures are really uh, important for illustrating the narrative flow of research and some of the biological chemical processes that can go on that aren't strictly bound to presenting data on a line. So for instance, uh, this top figure shows how the dust in the Sahara can deposit iron in the Gulf of Mexico. And that can lead to trichodesmium, this type of plankton on the top of the water in the Gulf of Mexico to produce a lot more nitrogen that gets dissolved in the water that these Karenia brevis cells will feed off of and Karenia brevis is also known as red tide. So if there's a lot of this nitrogen in the water, a lot of these Karenia brevis, spells, brevis cells will accumulate and form red tide blooms that will spawn off the coast of Florida and cause a lot of issues, both for tourism, fisheries, as well as, of course, you know, the people that live there. Um, so this figure without using any axes or legends whatsoever, was able to explain the entire narrative behind how storms in Africa can lead to red tide blooms. Uh, well, yes, you can write a paragraph and read the paragraph about it. It's very easy to digest this figure and understand the mechanics of 
uh, the meteorological impacts of, you know, weather in other countries on the estuarine and uh, marine health of a different country. Additionally, figures can be used to explain the research, re <laughs> research progress and process. Uh, this figure down here depicts the process that one of my colleagues took to uh, find and test a compound that can be used to neutralize the red tide in the water. Uh, while it is effective for killing the red tide, we also have to make sure that it's not killing everything else with it. So she started by testing in test tubes, and then she moved into flasks, and then she started testing it on benthic species like crabs to make sure that it wasn't hurting them, then moving on to larger tanks, to mesocosms that had urchins, crabs, and clams, and then eventually she tested it out in the field to see how it was affecting the plants out there as well. Depictions like these are not commonly found in research articles, but they're very, very, very helpful in conference presentations. Uh, and they're also really important for engaging with an audience with less familiarity on the topic, especially the public. The multiple layers types of figures is very common in a lot of research where there's multiple graphs that are being compared directly to each other that have the same axis. Um, for instance, with all of these figures comparing the market cost and market adoption of all of these uh, renewable energy sources, they all have the same X axis. This is all going from 2000 to 2020. So it makes sense that they're stacking them on top of each other so we can compare them directly. Uh, additionally, each column links up to a specific type of energy source. So we have our, you know, our solar panels, our off onshore wind, and then our offshore wind, as well as our uh, passenger electric vehicles. So it makes sense that these are in these columns and that they have the same X value so that they can be compared visually. Additionally, most of them have the same Y value so that we understand that, you know, this value uh, for the onshore wind cost is roughly equivalent to the uh, the solar panel cost in maybe like 2015. And then we can compare offshore winds, you know, having roughly the same price in also 2015. Um, additionally, uh, it's important to note that sometimes axes are a little bit different between these. So keep an eye on that. For instance, offshore wind uh, does have a much lower adoption rate than its other uh, eco-friendly siblings over here, but it is trying to show the general trend here. So it's not necessarily trying to mislead by putting it on a different axis. In fact, you can actually see that it does try to like, you know, emphasize that there is a different axis here. Um, but it's just trying to show that the overall trend, this, this curve here is very similar. Uh, additionally, when looking at multiple layers, I strongly encourage you to look at the caption. The caption for this figure is uh, very lengthy because it goes into quite a lot of detail, um, but I'm not going to bore you all by reading all of this out, but it's very important to take the moment to stop and read this so that you're actually understanding what is going on here because sometimes the nuances of uh, multiple layers and stacked graphs can sometimes get lost in translation. Um, especially if you're not looking out for those axes. So another very common figure you'll find in a lot of oceanographic research is the ocean transect figure. Basically what this is, is a slice taken out of the ocean, which it denotes exactly where it is here, as well as through this little call out window right here. So we know that this portion of the ocean is between West Africa and uh, north of South America. And so this bottom graph here shows the actual depth for this little slice that's taken out of the ocean. And the points that are labeled here are then translated down here so you can see exactly which points are which. In fact, um, if you look at this little map plot up here, you notice this lighter portion 
that is because of this little underwater mountain range right here. And this portion over here is likely these islands right here. Additionally, ocean transects are often paired with uh, colored contours like we saw in the last few maps. Um, once again, there's going to be this slice taken out of the ocean and then translated below into whatever graphs or, you know, figures they need for this particular study. So you'll also start to notice uh, a lot of similar trends among these graphs. Uh, for instance, sorry, for instance, uh, temperature and chlorophyll are often highly linked because chlorophyll is usually up at the surface and requires a certain um, a certain temperature in order to be produced by the phytoplankton. Um, so these two are often uh, have a lot of similarities to it. Uh, this one here, I think, is very interesting that the salinity is actually having these horizontal columns throughout the water. So once again, this means that this portion right here has a very low salinity compared to this middle region here. And then this region also is a region of low salinity as well. Next, we'll be talking about ordination plots, more specifically about principal component analysis. This is a form of exploratory data analysis, and it helps to reduce the dimensions of data. And I'm going to explain what that means. So for instance, let's say there's a school of fish that I'm studying. They all look very similar, but for maybe some of the observational reasons I have, or maybe I just have a hunch, I believe that some of these might actually be different species uh, that just look very, very similar. The term for a species that looks very similar to another is a cryptic species. Um, and so let's say I was able to uh, process some of their data, their mRNA data, to see how much their genes are being expressed through each fish. So for fish one, this is the column of expression for each of these genes. And obviously just looking at this table, it would be really hard to determine which is a different species just from this, you know, kind of vague nebulous data. So what we can do is we can try and plot all of those. Uh, and as we see, we see some trends. Um, seems fish one, fish two kind of have a uh, somewhat of a negative trend here, whereas fish two doesn't and fish four is all over the place, but still, this alone is not that easy to determine what we're really looking at here, uh, especially since this is only four fish, whereas there could be a lot in a data set. There could be like, you know, 300 lines that we're trying to look at. Um, oh, and a quick little note, I labeled this as fish N because I'm just calling that like, you know, the last fish in the, uh, the data set. Um, N is often used as a stand-in or variable to denote the entire amount of data within a set. So for instance, if you like had a survey of people talking about like, you know, what their favorite food is, you might see, you know, uh, responses of favorite food, parentheses, N 357. And that means 357 people individually responded to this. So for the sake of this example, I'm only going to show four of the fish at once because I didn't want to come up with random data for 300 of them. And I think it's also going to make it a little bit easier to have uh, less fish to keep in mind. So we have this chart and it's a little difficult to process. So what we can do is we can create another chart. Uh, this compares the gene expression of fish one to fish two. I'm not sure why those labels got covered up. Um, ignore that please. <laughs> But fish one is going to be our y-axis, fish two is going to be our x-axis. And as we see, there is a negative trend between their expression of genes, which makes sense because we see gene one. Fish uh, one is using it quite a lot, especially compared to fish two, which is barely using it at all. Uh, in gene nine, fish one isn't using it much, whereas fish two is using it uh, a lot. And so since we see this negative trend, we can uh, we can determine that they're using these different genes at uh, very, very different rates. Now, if it was a positive correlation, 
that would imply that they're using the same genes at roughly the same rate. So this would be a three and this would be like, you know, 2.7 and this would be like, you know, a two, this would be, you know, a, a 1.8 or something like that. Um, but since there's a negative trend, we can start to suspect that these two might in fact be different species because they are not using their genes the same way. However, if we want to try and combine uh, like, you know, fish three or further into this analysis, we would have to start going into multiple dimensions. And the human brain doesn't really like to, to look at things at more than two. Uh, we barely like looking at things that are in three directions. Um, it's kind of hard to analyze this when we have our uh, Z axis being our third fish uh, population or not population, but third fish example, third fish observation. Um, this is very difficult to analyze just from the flat image of it. There are programs that will allow you to like rotate it around to look at it a little bit better. Um, but that, you know, while that is great for when you have three data points, it, became, it comes moot once you have, you know, four or more, because once you start adding like, you know, four dimensions and five dimensions and six dimensions, it starts to become nigh incomprehensible for most people to try and uh, visualize and understand. The other option is to go back to the, um, the uh, just like comparing them on a flat 2D axis, like uh, having the one and two plot that I just showed you, we could make one for two and three, one and three, one and four, two and four, it's, it would be a lot. It'd be way too much, especially once you start having data sets that are like, you know, 300, 400, 1,000 fish to deal with. So instead of doing all of that, scientists create what is referred to as principal component analysis plots, like you see here. Um, this allows us to uh, visualize the variance between these populations without having to go through all of those dimensions. Uh, within like the last plot that I just showed you. So it's a form of dimensional reduction. So even though there's, I did include all four fish on this plot, it's still two dimensions and it's still easier to visualize and see the difference between them. Now, how this works is a data that is more similar will cluster together. Uh, there's also two axes. This is the principal component one and principal component two. So principal component one is much more important than principal component two. So for instance, we see fish one and fish three are very close together. This strongly implies that fish one, fish three might be the same species because they are using their genes in the, well, not the exact same way, you know, but they're using it in very similar rates. Whereas fish two and fish four are using them in very, very different ways. However, the distance between fish four and fish two and fish four and fish one and three is roughly the same, right? But the differences uh, are on different axes. So the difference, the, the distance between four and two is mostly on this x-axis, whereas the distance between four, one, and three is on mostly the y-axis. It's a bit of an angle, but you know. But since PC1 is more important than PC2, we would say that fish four and fish two are actually a lot more different from each other than fish four is to fish one and three. Based on this data alone, granted it's fake data, but based on the state alone, we would definitely be uh, looking further into whether or not fish one, fish three are the same species. We'd be fairly convinced that fish two is at the very least different from fish one, fish three, but we would have to do a little bit more research into seeing if fish four is actually different from these two fish, or if there was just, you know, enough of a uh, random differences between these fish that doesn't necessarily make it not part of the same species, but maybe this fish just doesn't have quite the same genes. I mean, humans are the same species, but we all have different genes. Um, but that is how you read a PCA plot and that's how they are constructed. But let's go ahead and look at a real world example. So here's a real world example. This data set is a very commonly used data set because it's included in um, a statistical program called RStudio. And it is a data set with a lot of data on flowers with three different species. 
for Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica. And for each of these species, there's lots of uh, variables listed for like heights, petal width, and petal length, and then sepal length and sepal width, as well as many other uh, pieces of data. So with this data set, we have calculated the abundance for these species along an environmental gradient. This gradient could be temperature, it could be humidity, it could be uh, soil acidity. Um, but for the sake of this example, uh, we're just going to say that maybe it's like temperature or something. This species, species one, are versicolor, uh, prefers lower temperature. Species three, are setosa, prefers higher temperature. And species two, our virginica, is fine, um, kind of straddling the line, so long as it's not too extreme in the hot or cold regions. So instead of creating a plot that's directly comparing our versicolor virginica and then our setosa and virginica and our setosa so on and so forth, we can just create the PC plot that I showed you last time. Now, the different species are clustered together along the x-axis, but there is a spread along the y. This makes sense because the y-axis variance is not as important, but members of a population may still have variance among them. So that does track, meaning that the, the uh, species definitely do seem to be in distinct species because they have that distinct x spread across this axis, but not uh, they don't have a distinct spread across the x-axis, but they have it across the y-axis. Sorry about that. Additionally, we can see that species Setosa is much more different than Versicolor and Virginica. So uh, that also tracks because it is further along the temperature gradient over here compared to species 2 and 1 having that overlap there. Um, it is a little bit surprising to me that uh, Virginica is all the way over here and not in the middle. So there probably might be more analysis that needs to go on with that. But moving forward, uh, we also see that there are four arrows for the petal length and sepal length and width. Uh, as you notice, the sepal length and width has longer arrows, but those are primarily in the Y direction, meaning that although there is some variance here, this variance is less important than the petal width and petal length, which is spreading out into the X direction. So even though this length is not as um, long, obviously, uh, our PC1 in this instance is like 93% of the variance, whereas this is only 5%. So this is basically, you know, 1 20th of the length that it would be compared to that. So this is much more important that this is going off into the X direction. And this indicates that a lot of the differences that we're seeing is from the pedal length and pedal width. Non-metric multidimensional scaling or NMDS is another form of exploratory data analysis. It is also telling you uh, how similar your data is based off of them clustering together, but it's different in PCA uh, because it doesn't actually show the percent variance along the bottom here uh, because it's it's putting multiple dimensions into two so it's very difficult to put that into the uh, percentage of variance but um, since it's showing this particular figure from Doyle et al 2018 is actually showing the shifts in a microbial community structure over time um, after having different treatments the darker colors are being are the later portions and so since we see a gradual shift in the colors uh, from this clustering, we can start to determine the trends of how these uh, microbial communities are responding to these treatments. Um, and so we can see that there is, in fact, uh, at least with, with these three groups, there does seem to be a significant shift due to those treatments. Um, this one, not so much. It doesn't seem to be affected by the treatments at all. So having this ordination plot is really helpful to understand how different species are affected by something over time as well. So later on in the workshop, you'll be discussing statistics and uncertainty and significant more. So I won't be going too in depth in that direction today, um, but I did want to go over how we represent uncertainty and significance in graphs. So this figure here is from the Narragansett um, 
Bay Estuary Program. It's from 2017, and it's representing the chlorophyll concentrations at a station called Fox Island, which is very close to GSO, um, from 1970 all the way up to 2017. And this is a, you know, that's a lot of data. Uh, very few uh, waterways and estuaries have time series data that go further back in the past than like 30 years. So it, Rhode Island is very lucky to have a lot of this long, uh, extensive data sets. Um, and so for this particular uh, figure, it's also important to note that there are two Y graphs. One side is for the yearly average chlorophyll concentration, the other is for the yearly maximum chlorophyll concentrations. Um, and the legend up here also depicts that as well. Um, so this bar here represents our standard deviation and having the average and maximum can help us to understand the standard deviations. Uh, I'm not going to get into what that term means, but just know that this is a statistical term we use to analyze the variance of something. And so additionally, I also want to talk about these p-values. These p-values show the significance of something. Basically, it, a p-value is, uh, it, it helps to determine the statistical probability that the results you're getting is due to natural variation or if it is something significant. So for instance, you know, there's always a little bit of a chance that it's going to rain on a particular day. If it rains, you know, three times in a week, that's probably falling within normal amount of variance. If it rains every single day in a week, that might be a little bit more significant. And it might mean that there was some sort of like, you know, storm or other meteorological uh, event going on. And so typically p-values above 0.5 are considered to be significant, um, but you'll be, you'll be talking more about that with uh, John later in the workshop. When researching climate change and trying to present the results of our data, we often have a lot of uncertainty that we need to depict. Um, as you see down here on our x-axis, uh, this is a projection into the future. Obviously, we can't be entirely certain of our projections, so we usually use these shaded regions as a way to, de to depict where these values could uh, wind up. So this is for the global mean sea level rise, um, and it shows the meters as our y-axis. So the higher this line is, the higher the sea is projected to rise. The blue line here represents a, um, these are two different scenarios uh, depending on the uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. Blue being the RCP 2.6, which is a better one, uh, a better like scenario, it's better for the planet. And then the RCP 8.5 is the red, and that indicates that there is a higher concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Unsurprisingly, uh, in the worst case scenario, or a worse uh, scenario, the sea level is projected to rise anywhere from uh, let's use the graph here, roughly half a meter to a meter. Um, that is the range. And this center line is the, the middle most uh, confident portion of that data. So it's projected to be 0 0.75. So uh, the, I'm not going to get too much into the uncertainty intervals, but typically it's like, you know, even on either side of that center line. Um, the blue one, as I noted previously, is the better option. We are still going to experience sea level rise, even under better uh, carbon dioxide emission conditions, but it will be significantly, uh, well, actually, technically, if these two are overlapping, you might have some debate whether or not it's significant, but once again, I need to, um, I need to stop. But with this scenario, 
the maximum is approximately you know 0 0.6 versus uh, just above 0 0.2 maybe 0 0.3 or so um, because once again it is even on either side and this region uh, so for instance if we were going to go to 2075 for this scenario uh, scientists are predicting that the sea level rise might be anything in this range. For uh, 2090, the worst, uh, worst scenario, not worst case, but the worst scenario of these two, they're expecting sea level rise to be anywhere within this range, but probably closer to the middle line. When thinking about long-term data sets, it's incredibly important to consider data aliasing. We need to understand the rate and duration of data sampling. For instance, with this data set, the points are evenly spaced. This allows us to track the natural seasonal variation in temperature very easily. If we only measured this change two times a year, the data may look much more consistent and lack that natural seasonal variation. Another example is measuring temperature only two to three times a year. This sampling rate has caused the data to look as though it is steadily declining, despite the fact that it is still oscillating normally. Sometimes sampling more does not reveal anything new, but can further support an observed trend, such as we see here. When reading an article or report, you should consider if the authors were looking for seasonal variation. Do they measure in different seasons? Did they sample annually? And so on. Understanding the natural phenomena that science that the scientists were observing can help you to think about whether or not the data was aliased as well. Finally, I will be briefly discussing where we obtain our data and how we process that data into graphs. Depending on the type of study, researchers may get their data from a variety of sources. This includes laboratory experiments. When scientists have a very specific question or set of questions that they want to test within a controlled environment, they can do so in a laboratory. Historical records are usually recorded without a specific question in mind, but are typically multi-decade uh, long surveys of various components like temperature, uh, carbon dioxide, concentrations, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and so on. Like I said, they're not usually recorded with a very specific question in mind, but they can be used later on to analyze trends and answer other questions in the future. Commercial fisheries are very important for uh, those studying oceanography because they, while they are typically recorded for the sake of understanding the economic impact of these species, in doing so, they're also essentially performing a census on these species and allowing us to understand the relative size and location of all of these species. Additionally, satellite imagery is very, very important. It allows us to detect the chlorophyll within the water to help us kind of understand how productive that water might be, how many like, you know, uh, plankton might be in the water, therefore how many uh, zooplankton and then other fish, so on and so forth. It's really important for us to be able to scan the water and start to determine what chemicals are in it. It can also be used to delineate the shoreline, meaning that we can use the images we get from these satellites to see the ground and see where the ground is versus where the water is. And we can track that over time in order to determine how the shoreline might be changing in uh, regards to sea level change. Additionally, um, when scientists aren't asking a very specific question, uh, or maybe they are, they just can't do it in a li uh, laboratory, they will go out into the field. And uh, this is what all scientists usually use to refer to going out into the world to getting these observations, but does not specifically mean like the middle of like a grassy field. So you'll have a uh, oceanographer say, oh, I'm doing field work, I'm going out into the field, but in reality, they're getting a boat and they're gonna be in water. It can kind of be a little bit confusing. So. For example, I'm, I'm currently bored with Captain Bird, assisting with this week's GSO fish trawl survey. The data that we collect today the data that we collect is usually raw, unprocessed, and quite frankly, really difficult to understand on its own. For instance, this is a data set that I've personally used. It is of all the shrimp landings in Louisiana from 1973 to 2014, as you see down here. 
there is a lot of data here. It is nearly, if you look over here, it is nearly half a million rows long in this spreadsheet. Now, if I were to hand you half a million rows of shrimp data, you probably wouldn't be able to understand any of it just from looking at it. So we need to process this in order to put this into graphs. And the way that we do that is often through coding because trying to go through all this manually uh, not only would probably take a lot of time and resources, would probably lead to a lot of mistakes as well. So coding is very, very important. There are a variety of programming languages that researchers can use to process their data. Some of the more common ones are Python and R, which is what you can see in the background here. It is a statistical software, but can also be used for data management. When we upload our data into these uh, programming languages, we can then compile them, standardize them, summarize them, and then statistically analyze them with a lot more accuracy and frankly, uh, a lot less of a headache. So once we have that, we can then start creating our graphs. Once your data is processed and compiled, you can then use certain programs to turn those points of data into dots, lines, pie charts, bar graphs, so on and so forth. Microsoft Excel and Google Sheets are some of the more common ones, but the program that I showed you on the previous slide, RStudio, is actually where I made this graph. And this graph is representing some of the data from the, um, the data that I showed two slides ago, the uh, half a million row long spreadsheets. Uh, when you're making graphs, it's really important to make sure that you're iterating many times to make sure that you are depicting your results accurately, uh, but also efficiently and making sure that sometimes even the aesthetics aren't uh, messing up the message of your graph. Because sometimes even using, you know, green and red in different scenarios might lead to an unintentional bias in the interpretation of that graph. You also need to make sure that you're labeling things appropriately, like going through this graph. I should have gone through and labeled shrimp landings and probably written out Louisiana. I should have been a lot more specific, but for the sake of this graph, this was just for um, internal uh, dissemination of results. So I was just sending this to my boss essentially. So, but when you're actually doing real scientific research and putting this into an article, it needs to be a lot more specific. A figure and its caption should be able to stand on its own without the article and should still be understandable. If I were to just go out into the street and hand this to you, you probably wouldn't exactly know what it's referencing. So although this is my graph, it's not one of the best examples. So I would need to iterate on this a little bit more. I hope over the course of this video, you gain more confidence in understanding the language of science and how researchers depict their data through graphs and figures. We discussed where to start looking at a graph, how to orient yourself, and how some graphs may choose to mislead you. I have also shown you some of the different types of graphs you may see when looking at scientific articles. We then discussed how to obtain raw data, process it, and how we end up turning it into graphs. During the upcoming live session of this workshop, we will go through these challenge slides I will give you some unique graphs and figures that we will interpret and discuss in groups. I'm excited to see you then.